Still ain't got me on. There we go. All right, guys. Page 184. We're going to sing He Abides. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way For the hand of God in all my life I see And the reason of my bliss, yes the secret all is this That the comforter abides with me He abides, he abides, hallelujah
this evening. Good to see all of you. It's our Wednesday night prayer meeting, so if you have a prayer request, praise report, we'll take that in at this time, and then we'll gather around the altar for prayer. Any requests tonight? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Any others? All right, let's remember, continue to remember Brother Ken Shamlin in our prayers. Yes. Yes. Franklin Graham requests prayer for everybody to pray for our president today. All right. Let's remember that request. Yes. Yes. To John Northrop yesterday. Just continue to remember him. He sounded really good, and uh, he said he's responding well to the latest medicine. So he said, just keep praying. So remember him in prayer. Yes. Remember that request. Yes. All right. Remember Bryce Ashmore uh, is in the hospital and Becky Woodruff. So let's remember both of them. Yes. She is going home. Wonderful. Wonderful. To remember her. Yes. Got to stand and praise God. Amen. Luke is his home. Amen. Amen. Got a little ways to go with some rehab, but just continue to pray for him. Amen. Amen. Any others? Yes. Remember Dorothy Day? Um, she's got some stomach issues. Um, she went to the doctor today to try and sort it all out. All right. Let's remember the days. Amen. Yes. Also, well, my best friend, Bridget uh, Johnson, she has trouble with her eyes. Yes. Uh, take your prayers for Betty uh, 
Remember those requests. Any others? Yes. Amen. Any others? Well, I had an aunt that uh, lost her husband uh, this morning, and uh, if I'm honest, I, I don't think he was saved. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go there tomorrow and, and talk to them again, and I know most of them aren't saved, and I just pray that the, the Lord would just open the doors and it would give me words to just maybe just, I could say something that will, you know, get to them or they might want to come and accept the Lord. They know where I stand and what I stand for, so, and I always try to witness to them, so just remember that prayer. So. Amen. Amen. Remember that request. Any others? Any unspoken requests, you'll raise your hand. All the will gather around the altar as we sing. Sweet of, of prayer, sweet of
come for tonight's offering goes to our Good Samaritan Fund. Everything that you give uh, goes to support that. Goes to the Good Samaritan Fund. Everything you give goes to support uh, that this evening. Brother Nelson, would you pray for us? Bibles turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. So we continue looking at the life of Elijah. Pick up where we left off last week. Let's do remember the camp meeting going on in Ohio. Ronald and them are there tonight. They'll be heading home, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, we got up there. Would you believe it's hotter up there than it is down here? <laughs> it's 92 degrees. Unreal. It's good to be back in the cool weather <laughs> where it's much cooler. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's going to be 50 degrees this weekend, though, so we missed out. 1 Kings chapter 17, we'll revisit where we were uh, last week. Just look at verse 1, we're going to move on down verse by verse. But it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain, notice, these years, but according to my word. Now, as we, we looked at last week, uh, in the history of Israel, there were, there were three kings that reigned. Uh, their names were King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. Uh, after King Solomon passed away, his son Rehoboam, uh, there were some older gentlemen that came to him. Uh, you would call them elders, and they said, could you take it a little easy on us? Your, your dad was a little hard on us, so could you make it easy on us? Rehoboam said, let me check with my inner circle. He went to some people who were his age, and they said, hey, they're trying to take advantage of you. You be harder on them, not easier. So he comes back and said, you thought my dad was tough. I'm way tougher. You thought taxes were tough. Now they're going to be way worse. And so there was a civil war that took place. There was a split in the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom split into Rehoboam, stayed in the south, the southern kingdom called Judah. And Jeroboam took the kingdom to the north called Israel. Now, if you remember last week, we said that in the northern kingdom, there were 19 kings over a 200-year period of time. And how many of those 19 were evil? All of them. Every single one of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. You read about them, and it says, and they reigned and did evil in the sight of the Lord. The next one comes along, did evil in the sight of the Lord. The next one comes so, so, and so. And the, the, the southern kingdom of Judah... 
they had 17 kings and about half of them uh, were evil and the other half were, were somewhat good. But we're, we're moving to the northern kingdom and, and they're getting evil and more evil and more evil and all of a sudden we come to a stop in 1 Kings 17 and there's a guy on the throne by the name of Ahab. The Bible said he was more wicked than all those who came before him and if that's not bad enough, he marries a woman by the name of Jezebel, the most evil woman in all the Bible. And so you've got these two people reigning and Jezebel brings in Baal worship, idolatry. They, they, uh, Israel worshipped idols, but she brings in this Baal worship and, and boy, it's just the new thing and everyone's doing it. And so we need a prophet sent from God to show up on the scene and do something about this. And that's where Elijah comes in. And so now we're going to pick up in verses 2 and 3. Elijah has just stood before the king, just told him, gave him a mandate. There's not going to be do or reign until I say so. Notice what it says in verse 2. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, talking about Elijah, Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Now, as we, as we read those words, we begin to see, and this is what you want, I want you to see tonight. This is the theme of the message tonight. What I want you to see is the surprising nature of God's plan, okay? The surprising nature of God's plan. This plan doesn't make sense. I mean, the most logical thing to do would be to keep Elijah where? In the face of this evil king. To, to, to use the prophet and, and, and force him to make Ahab surrender to the ways of God. This doesn't make any sense. In fact, we read of no other prophet that's willing to step forward to take on Ahab and Jezebel. Only Elijah. No one else to, to confront this evil king and his more evil wife. And it only makes sense. Why not, God, leave Elijah there in Ahab's face in the court of the king? But here's what I want you to find out tonight. God's plan is always full of surprises. Don't forget that. God's plan is... Is, is always full of mystery. Let me give you an example of God's plan being full of surprises. Here it is. Here's my example. I'm your pastor. <laughs> How'd you like that laugh? Be honest. Be honest. Jimmy, when I was running around with your son, we were always getting in trouble. Do you believe I was going to be up here pastoring this great church? I mean, let's be serious. Jimmy, little Jimmy did. Not you. Dennis, when I was sinking your boat in the middle of the lake, did you think I was going to be pastoring this great church? God's ways, God's plans are always full of surprises. Always. While we might have chosen to to leave Elijah there standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ahab, it wasn't the Father's plan. I was away this weekend, couldn't be here. Who's filling my place? Kevin Pope. Who would have thought Kevin Pope would have been right here filling it? <laughs> Who led the service? Ace Andrews. Who would have ever thought that he would have been leading the service? God's ways and God's plan is always full of surprises. I say that to say this. Those little snot nosed kids out there that are mean as whips, they might be your pastor someday. I'm serious. They might be leading. Don't ever count out what God can do with anyone in the ministry. God's plan is full of surprises. And we see that here. You know, this is not the Father's plan. God immediately tells Elijah, go away into a place of isolation, and I want you to hide from everyone. Here's why. 
for Elijah to be useful in the Lord's hand in the future, he must be humbled and he must be forced to trust the Lord. I know it's, it's hard sometimes to trust what the Lord's doing, to trust his way. We don't see the end result. He does. But for Elijah, he has to, to learn to trust the Lord. A.W. Tozer said this. What a quote. He said, it's doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. He said, it has been my observation over the years that the deeper the hurt, the greater the usefulness for God. So God sends Elijah to a place called Cherith. Now understand, often in the Old Testament, the original name of, of a place, it carries a symbolic meaning. This is certainly the case with this name, Cherith. By the way, today no one can identify the location of that brook in Israel. We don't know where it's at. Wouldn't you love to know where this brook was at? Because if we know where it was at in Israel, guess where we'd be visiting every single stop? We'd go to that brook. We don't know where it's at. We do know it's, it, it, the name is derived from the original verb, which is cheroth, which means to cut off or to cut down. How ironic. Because while at Cherith, the man who is now the number one spokesman for God, as he stands before Ahab, will now be cut off from all involvement and in all activities. And at the same time, Elijah is going to be cut down to size. As the Lord uses an uncomfortable situation to force him to trust him for each day's needs. Did it work? I want you to look at something here in 1 Kings chapter 17. This is a blessing. In 1 Kings 17.1, when the writer describes Elijah... He calls him simply Elijah the Tishbite. That's it. But when you get at the end of the chapter in verse number 24, after his basic training experience at Cherith, he is no longer called Elijah the Tishbite. He is called Elijah a man of God. See, at the beginning of the chapter, he's simply Elijah from a town somewhere in Gilead. By the end of the chapter, he emerges as a man of God. What happened? Between verses 1 and verse 24, God is going to do a work in the life of Elijah. Chuck Swindoll, in his book on Elijah, calls Cherith Elijah's boot camp. This is what he says. He says, any recruit who has been through boot camp can tell you that every hour of the day someone is ordering you where to go, when to be there, what to do, and how to survive. Swindoll said God did the exact same thing for his prophet. He told Elijah exactly where he was to go, what he was to do when he got there, and how he would manage to survive. So tonight we are looking at this boot camp in Cherith. I want you to notice with me the first thing God tells Elijah to do. The very first thing he was to do, he was to hide. Look at verse number 3. He says, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Now, now I want you to put yourself in Elijah's place. You are a prophet you are called of God to get in the face of Ahab and Jezebel who's doing evil. And now God says, go away. Go hide. And I say, that does not make sense to me, does it you? Why is he going to hide? He's a prophet. Prophets are, are out there in the public. Prophets are proclaiming God's word in front of people. I can just see him saying, Lord, I've been called to preach. Yet God tells Elijah, not this time, Go hide. One of the hardest commands to obey is the command to go hide. What do I mean by that? One of the hardest commands is to just go get alone by yourself. Deliberately get away from the public. 
Jesus did that, by the way. Deliberately remain hidden. Can you do that? Can you just get away? Can, can you just turn off your cell phone? Right? How, how about all day? Don't even look at it. Just get up. Turn the computer off. And just listen for God to speak. Now some of you will say, absolutely, that sounds like a dream come true. But you know what you see more than not? People going on vacation, what they got in their hand? They got their phone. They're always on it. They're on their computers. It's harder than you might think, especially if you're in a position where there is great responsibility that you have. Because when you leave, what are you thinking? Uh, how is this going to get done? Or, or, or how is this going to turn out? But, but sometimes God just wants you to turn everything off and just listen to him try to speak to you. God had two reasons here for commanding Elijah to hide himself. First, he wants to protect Elijah from Ahab. Elijah doesn't know it yet, but Ahab, well, really it's his wife Jezebel, wants him dead. But the second reason is he wants to train him to become a man of God. So the first thing God tells Elisha is just go and hide. And the first thing God does after he sends Elijah to this place called Cherith is he tells them how he's going to survive. Yes, this is going to be a, a lonely experience. But God gives Elijah this remarkable promise. Look at this promise in verse number 4. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the who? The ravens to feed thee there. Here we are given evidence of the first ever catering service in the Bible. Right there. And who's doing the catering? Birds, ravens. Isn't that incredible? Imagine the conversation. If you were just happen to run into Elijah as he's walking to Cherith and you come up and you say, Hey, hey uh, Elijah, where are you going? I don't know. Some place called Cherith. What's there? I don't know. Some small brook running through it. Where is it? I'm not really sure. God's going to show me. What are you going to do there? I have no idea. I know I'll probably drink from this little brook. Brook, what are you going to eat? Well, that's a funny story. God's going to send some birds to bring me some food. You would have thought, this is crazy. I can't imagine this. By the way, would you have asked God any questions if he had told you to do that? Hey, trust me, uh, you don't know where you're going, but there's this brook there, and I want you to walk this way. And by the way, I'm going to send some birds to feed you. Do you think you might have asked God any question? I would have. Like, Why? How come? What's the purpose? I am a prophet. But look what Elijah does in verse number 5. So he went. Hear any uh, arguing there? So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Without one moment's hesitation, Elijah obeys. He didn't even ask why. And notice one word here that, that I, I think we move over too quickly. Look at that word, dwelt. Do you see that word there? And he went and dwelt. That word dwelt means to live all the time. So he went and he was going to live all the time. I thought it's one thing to take maybe a trip for a day, right, to this brook. Or maybe go camping for the weekend. Any campers out there? All right, three of you. You go camping for, for a weekend. Or, or maybe you'd spend two or three weeks backpacking in the wilderness by, by Cherith. But it's quite another thing to live there. To live in this wilderness Alone for an extended time. But that's exactly what Elijah is going to do for months, possibly the better part of a year. Could you do that? God said, go there, settle there, 
and I want you to live there. And Elijah goes in obedience right away. I thought, would we accept from God with such immediate obedience? I mean, seriously, how, must, how many of us would have said, you know what, yes, sir, Lord, I trust you completely. I don't have any questions or, or want any answers. One writer said this, I love it. He said, whether in the palace or in private, Elijah was ready to serve his Lord. Whether in the spotlight or in silence, he was satisfied in the secrecy of the quiet hills beside a brook east of Jordan, and there God supplied his needs. Look at verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the brook. I told this story about four or five years ago to the little kids in chapel, and I read it this way. I said, and the ravens brought him Chick-fil-A sandwiches in the morning and 10-piece nuggets in the evening. That really got their attention. Now, he really didn't do that, but, but wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? I mean, see, just standing there, and all of a sudden you see all these ravens, and they're carrying bread in their mouth and meat in their mouth, and and you don't know where they're heading. Jeff, me and you talked about this, that there is a chance, and I love thinking that this might have happened, that these birds stopped at Ahab's kingdom and picked up the bread and picked up the meat because this was happening every single day. Wouldn't you love to have seen that? Ahab's getting ready to sit down for dinner, and all of a sudden, here come these ravens. I don't know where they're coming from, but every single day, they come in and take our food, our bread, and our meat, and they bring it right on in to Elijah. That would have been quite the story. We don't know that for sure, but I'd have loved to have seen that. A bit of bread in the morning, uh, another small sandwich in the evening, and throughout the day, he could have cool, refreshing water any time he wanted. If you've ever traveled uh, to Israel... And the area across the Jordan, you know how precious water is in that land, especially that far south, let alone during a a drought. Yet the Bible says God provided his prophets with a a fresh, trickling brook of water. Anytime he wanted to, he could get on his face, cup his hands, and drink all he wants. How many are thirsty right now? Just thinking about that. Could drink all he wants. But wouldn't you know it, he's starting to get used to it, kind of like in that catering service every day. Cool water anytime he wants. But you know that old saying, all good things have to come to an end. Look what happens in verse number seven. And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up. Because there had been what? No rain in the land. Of course there's no rain. Who told us there would be no rain in verse number one? Elijah. And we see this is coming to pass. Just imagine with me. One morning Elijah noticed that the the brook's not gushing over the rocks as it had in days past. Over the next few days he he watches it as it dwindles until there's only a, a trickle. Then one morning, there's no water, just wet sand. As the hot wind comes in and and moves over this this brook, the the sand begins to harden. And and before long, there are are cracks that are appearing in the bed of the brook. And there's, there's no more water now, and the brook is all dried up. That's where I want to end tonight. The brook is all dried up. Let me ask you something. You ever been there? Does that experience sound familiar to any of you? That at any time the brook is beginning to dry up? Uh, That maybe at one time there was the joy of a full bank account? Maybe a booming business? An ever-expanding career, a magnificent ministry, everything's going your way, but then something happens, and the brook is, is dried up. The blessings of God, they, they seem to have disappeared. 
Your prayers, they seem useless. Maybe uh, church services, they're, they're not as moving as they were when things were going good in life. Sometimes you pray and you say, does he hear me? The heavens seem like brass. I speak to him, nothing comes back. Your brook's dried up. Understand, that's what happened to John Bunyan. Never heard of that guy? John Bunyan was a preacher. And John Bunyan, back in the 17th century in England... He went around and he preached against the sinfulness of his day. And because of that, the authorities arrested him and threw him into prison. His brook of opportunity, his brook of freedom was all dried up. But listen, because Bunyan firmly believed God was still alive and working in his life, you know what he did? He turned that prison into a place of praise and creativity. While he was there, he began to write this little book, you might have heard of it, called Pilgrim's Progress. While there, he writes the most famous allegory in the history of the English language. So I want to say this to you tonight as we close. Dried up brooks in your life, no way cancel out God's providential plan. Often, they cause his plan to emerge. So what about you tonight? Barren place in your life? Dried up brook? Ask him where God is? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You're here tonight. And you'd be honest. You'd say, I- I'm there. I'm in, a, I'm in a dried up brook. Everywhere I turn, there there seems to be nothing there but parched, barren land. I have a need in my life, a a burden. I'm going through some things and I'm asking God to to come on the scene, but it, it just doesn't seem like nothing's happening. I pray and I pray and it seems like nothing is happening. Maybe it's a financial issue, a a spiritual issue, a personal, whatever it is, you'd be honest, you say, I feel like I'm I'm in a a dried up brook. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You say, that's me. That's where I'm at right now. Would you remember me in prayer? Would you just slip up your hand? Just be honest. Bless all the hands. Bless me. I'm in a dried up brook. I don't understand. I, I, don't, I don't understand why. Here's what I want to leave you tonight with. Listen, you don't have to understand. You hear me? Hear this. You don't have to understand. But here's what you have to do. You have to trust the one who does understand. Can you do that? Can you put your trust in someone whose thoughts are way higher than our thoughts? Can you do that? Maybe you're here tonight, you have loved ones who are unsaved. And they need Jesus in their life. You want to remember them in prayer? Would you just slip up your hand? I say, pray for me. So many tonight have loved ones who are unsaved. They need the Lord in their life. Maybe you're here tonight and you have a, a, a need in your life, whatever it may be, and you want to be remembered in prayer. God knows each and every heart. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for each and every person here tonight and the honesty. There are, there are people here tonight going through some things. Whatever it may be, it seems like the, the brook's dried up. God, I pray tonight that, that you have a plan. You have a purpose for this. And we don't have to understand it. But we're going to trust you. So we give it to you, God. We're putting our trust and our faith in you as you lead us through this dried, barren land. There are any tonight, God, that that they just need to come and pray and, and lay these concerns on the altar that they would. Just give them over to you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together and as we sing, if you need to come and pray, would you come? Just as I am with
Seeing none, come back Sunday, we'll have another good time.